So behind all of this is, is uh, in the Australian context, is this wave of new investment in transport. So we've already heard that there's a, a range of key metro projects going in in our major capital cities. Uh, this is the most significant shift in uh, transport thinking and investment we've seen in this country in a long time. And probably if, if we take the long view, it's the, uh, it's the first major reinvestment in public transport rather than the road orientated investment models that we've seen over the last, say, 60, 70 years, since the late 1800s when the gold rush fueled a huge investment and probably delivered 80% or 90% of the transport that we see in our cities, particularly the, the Melbourne tramway, so on and so forth. So that's one of the key things. The, the, the second is um, the focus on how we harness these major investments, because they're not cheap, major metro projects, multi-billion dollars, they're public interest projects. How do we actually make sure that we're getting those to deliver the kind of outcomes the public are expecting? And then thirdly, and I think uh, my colleagues have started to touch on this, is how do we begin to uh, introduce delight and experience into those projects? And how do we begin to unlock the kind of places that we think will establish our cities as places that are attractive, exciting, and begin to position us for, a, uh, I suppose, the economy of the future. There's a series of themes that I'll talk about. Um, I want to run through some background drivers, context, and I hope uh, we've all had a copy, because there's a, there's a few key statistics here that I want to present in relation to Australia and how that sets the backdrop. Then move through into some broader thinking, cities and corridors before we start thinking about the human dimension and how that starts stitching into places. And I'll be using a series of projects across different modes to begin to illustrate those different outcomes. The wider backdrop is that Australia is one of the most rapidly growing nations on the planet, uh, third fastest growing nation population-wise in the OECD. The ABS is highlighting that we've got two to 400% growth in our major, well, as a total, over the next 80-odd uh, years. And uh, we're seeing that growth concentrating in our major cities. So our bigger city is going to get bigger, and I expect that we'll get a second tier of cities beginning to emerge as well. So this begins to highlight some key challenges in relation to how we begin to maintain those cities as functioning systems, but also how we begin to uh, recognise the livability offer that Australia has. And at the moment, I think it's fair to say that Australia's when you look at across the indices, it's probably got the highest concentration of the most livable cities on the planet, which is, a, which is a really strange thing when you think of the scale of Australia from a population perspective. Um, the challenge for us with the backdrop of that level of growth is how we can maintain that level of livability, particularly when that growth's occurring in our major cities. And um, I think the other key thing here is that uh, the global economy is shifting, knowledge workers, creative industries, so on and so forth, are really the, the future wealth of our nations and the future wealth of our cities. And how we position our cities from a livability perspective uh, is fundamental to not only growing and retaining our own talent, but attracting other people's talent. And um, that, I think, is one of the most competitive issues for, for us as a nation moving forward. We have a big country with a small population, and interestingly, our economic function is concentrated in the largest five cities. And this graph, or this, this illustration, really shocked me when I saw it. So the red bits are where 80% of our gross domestic product are generated. So once again, we see all of this focus beginning to emerge on our five largest cities. And it, uh, for us, it raises the question, what, what is the role of our cities as we look to the future? It's, it's a question that exists not on, only in Australia, London, uh, San Francisco, other cities, Southeast Asia, so on and so forth. What, what do they need to do in the long term? And importantly, what are we expecting from our public transport investment in relation to setting them up for the future? And uh, for me, uh, cities are where the key, key, key opportunities of economic performance and livability overlap. And I think in the future, that's a, a, a very important uh, formula to get right. There's been a recognition for a long time that uh, the road networks that we've been delivering in our cities for the last half century will be inadequate to deal with uh, future pressures. Now, we know that uh, with rideshare programs, vehicle automation, there's a lot of change beginning to occur in this space. There's a lot of disruption happening. But, uh, one thing that almost all of the academics can agree on is that uh, whatever um, new technologies are introduced 
you still need trunk public transport infrastructure to make the wider network function effective in the future. So the debate is not about whether you need public transport or not, it's how you deliver it into the cities to make them highest performing in the future. Uh, when we think about the livability angle again, um, in Australia, uh, even though we have a love affair with, with the car, as the US does and many other places on the planet, as we've heard, Middle East, um, interestingly, uh, when the Property Council do their annual survey on what the public thinks uh, are the key ingredients for livability, uh, public transport almost always outranks uh, the car network in terms of how we, uh, how we think our livable city to create it. So that, that I think is an interesting observation. When we start looking at mode share across our major cities, uh, Canberra is probably the outlier here, which, which is our nation's capital, um, but they, more than any other city uh, in Australia, have the strongest love affair with the car. And that plays out when you start looking at those mode share targets. Now, despite the rhetoric, Australia has a long way to go before it's getting a really well-balanced modal split between vehicles, uh, public transport, so on and so forth. Active travel is probably one of the biggest latent opportunities here, given our climatic opportunities as well. And uh, a recently released study, this one was by RMIT, this came out last month, and it begins to uh, chart the eight different cities around Australia. Uh, these graphs show the heat map of access to public transport in those cities. And when I think about our cities at a large scale, I ask the question, well, is it a supply, supply or demand situation? Why have we got such low ridership levels? And when we look at the supply of public transport into our cities, it's fairly clear that we're probably not doing as good a job as we should be doing in terms of providing the infrastructure required to enable more sustainable settlement patterns. We know um, that uh, transport, when it's done well, creates value. And uh, in our practice, we often talk about virtuous versus vicious infrastructure. And when you're looking at a city um, and you compare, say, road infrastructure versus uh, public transport infrastructure, um, you actually find that well-designed and delivered public transport, and particularly rail infrastructure, increases property values, economic productivity, whereas road infrastructure begins to erode it. And the two uh, graphs on the right-hand side, this is data out of Sydney, you're getting a 5% year-on-year gain in property values above everywhere else around rail, whereas if you're close to the major roads, you're getting a 10% reduction. Now, one of my colleagues was talking about scale, and when we think about public transport or our cities, we can't just devote our thinking to a building, to a precinct. We need to think about how those major investments position that city on the global stage, there's a different set of objectives and imperatives for a project. So what are we doing for sustainability? How is this project unlocking the nation's productivity opportunities? How are we beginning to position the city and the region to perform more effectively economically? And how are we beginning to shape the infrastructure to unlock the potential of each of the places that it, that it touches? So that's most of the statistical stuff out of the way. We can start talking about projects. And um, I also want to touch on some of the broad policy moves that we're seeing around Australia as well. Um, now, it starts at the metropolitan scale, and this is where uh, management of growth and delivery of transport infrastructure collide. In the case of uh, Sydney, uh, just last year, they came up with the idea of a, a three-city model in relation to positioning that city for the future. Um, to the east, we see what they describe as uh, global Sydney. This is the, the harbour city. This is the, the pieces of Sydney that everyone knows and loves. But as the city begins to grow exp exponentially into the future, up to 8 million or so, how does it begin to accommodate all of that growth? And so we see Parramatta, which is central Sydney, beginning to emerge, as well as a future growth area to the west. Now, each of these cities are underpinned by major transport investments. So, Western Sydney is focused around a new major airport. There needs to be light rail, metro, and other elements too. Greater Parramatta, that's all underpinned by metro, major road investment, as well as light rail. And I would argue that uh, those infrastructure investments are absolutely fundamental to the success of that particular city-shaped model. 
Now this is the Gold Coast, which is a rapidly growing but much smaller city. And um, they've just recently delivered light rail, which has become the, uh, I suppose, the, the, the new way that they're beginning to shape their city. And they're transitioning from a high proportion of greenfield growth to a coordinated and consolidated uh, infill growth network. And uh, so in order for them to achieve a more sustainable and livable city pattern, they've chosen public transport above road transport. And when we start thinking about a city at a corridor scale, we can begin to look at how we coordinate and focus areas of growth. And for me, one of the interesting things about this scale of working is uh, that you can begin to interrogate the networks of the city and start looking at the active travel networks. You can start looking at how you're coordinating uh, public transport networks with road and other outcomes. And uh, the Gold Coast uh, has more canals than Amsterdam and Venice combined. And uh, that actually leaves a legacy of a fragmented mosaic of communities. And uh, one of the key opportunities that was unlocked through this piece of work was that with a series of uh, new green bridges, in addition to the light rail, you can begin to unlock a green mesh of active travel connections. And uh, that's fundamental to stitching together the disparate network of centres, that whilst it's a linear city, it's also a polycentric city. This is the Sunshine Coast, and uh, with any major project, um, it's fundamental to look at how you accommodate the growth. And we often look at three or four different growth scenarios. You see them on the, the top right-hand side here. Do you pursue a linear growth model, a village growth model, polycentric, so on and so forth. And this is important in relation to building the narrative that can support public transport uh, from a community and political perspective. Uh, our nation's capital, this is uh, Canberra. They've also chosen to invest in light rail. And here you've got very low growth rates. And one of the big issues with Canberra is that it's got a lot of overscaled monumental avenues and, and infrastructure. And the key opportunity here was to start to overlay that, that broad monumental infrastructure with some people-oriented places, stitching in the green networks. In Brisbane, uh, one of the projects that's advancing is their metro project. I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about Melbourne Metro in the last few days. Uh, the same thing's happening in, in both Bris Brisbane and Sydney. And uh, in Brisbane, the key opportunity is to stitch together that city's major institutional, education, health and employment clusters. And uh, these four stations begin to create the economic spine and livability spine of the city as it moves into the future. But much more than that, it's also about stitching together a series of really substantial renewal precincts. And uh, I'm sure as we begin to look at this in a bit more detail as it heads into procurement, these outcomes will begin to become more and more important, along with the value capture agenda that's being pursued by a lot of the different governments that we see around the country. So shifting down a scale again, because we, we always need to keep moving from the strategic to the specific and place-based, uh, we really need to make sure that these infrastructure projects, the mega-scale projects, uh, relate to the human environment. And, uh, it's, it's wonderful to have a, a perfectly operating system through a city, but uh, if it's not delivering a place that attracts and retains people, it's not fit for purpose. And uh, I think when we see the briefs come out for these me mega projects, it's very difficult to always bring it back to that when you've got such overwhelming cost and other drivers pushing towards a, an engineer-led solution. And um, for me, uh, particularly from a political perspective, uh, making sure that it's, it's people-centric design is one of the most important things. And uh, some of the statistics we have about uh, experience, uh, the appetite for experience and the rise of the experience economy back this up hugely. And we're dealing with infrastructure here that's going to be intergenerational. So do we design for the people of today or do we design for the millennials and the next generations after that? Because these are the railways that were delivered a century ago and will shape our cities into the future. So out of all of that, um, I wanted to run through probably five quick projects here and take one takeout from each of them. Uh, the first is uh, Norway Station. This is part of the uh, Northwest Rail Project in Sydney. Um, this is a, a ostensibly a station in the middle of a business park which is relatively dispersed. So the key, the key idea here is to create a central focus and to begin to reintegrate the public realm around the station to make this place walkable rather than a vehicle-orientated uh, precinct. 
A key part of that is actually making sure that you've got the station infrastructure that's attractive, engaging, climatically responsive, it's got the materiality that we've been talking about. Now, one of the other things is that, uh, and I think this has been touched on with a couple of the previous presentations, is the notion of stations uh, as more than just hubs for transport. And we're seeing this trend play out with aviation, with uh, ferries and, and, and cruise terminals, uh, and also with rail stations throughout Europe and also Southeast Asia. And uh, this is uh, the winning design competition for the upgrade of Flinders Street Station. And uh, it envisaged much more than just a railway station. It included events and, and a whole range of new program into the station to make it a, a real public focal point in the city and a civic destination. <coughs> Now, I won't touch on this one for long, but even very modest transport projects can be harnessed as, as a basis for renewal. And this is Newcastle in uh, uh, just north of Sydney, which uh, had been in decline after uh, our major steel manufacturer pulled out. So using transport to unlock and reinforce that. Going back to Canberra, um, how do you take a light rail system and use that as a basis for a linear renewal process? And, the key focus for this one um, is a street called Northbourne Avenue, which is one of the ceremonial approach routes to the nation's capital. And how does that begin to be shaped long term into something which takes you from the bush to the capital? And uh, if, if you know what uh, Canberra likes to call itself, it's the bush capital, which is a fundamental piece of their uh, local mythology. How do we begin to, uh, and this is a project in Perth, the uh, stadium's just been delivered and opened. Um, how do we begin to unlock some of those key renewal precincts around the stations? And I think for the audience that we're dealing with here, uh, which is a focus on um, tall buildings and integrated development, what is overstation development in Australia? And uh, I think um, when we look at uh, examples in Japan, in Hong Kong, in Southeast Asia, as well as the US, um, the, the notion of highly complex integrated stations which, which deliver a whole range of different land uses is something that we're aspiring to. Uh, outside of the CBD of Melbourne and the CBD of Sydney, it gets more challenging to deliver because the, the property values that we have in Australia make it challenging to justify the investment in, in the structural integrity of these stations. So this is Chin Hai that we've been working on in, in China. But uh, if we think about the evolution of overstation development in Australia, um, the contemporary forms of it, uh, it, it, it's actually been a little bit more modest. Uh, and this is 140 William Street in Perth. It was originally delivered as a standalone station with structural integrity. And then they came back a couple of years later, began to deliver an integrated precinct over the top. And, uh, even though this may have started a little bit slower, it's become a buzzing part of the inner city of Perth and it's unlocked a whole range of new uh, public realm connections. And it's got office, retail, uh, community uses, and in fact we've just relocated our Perth office into this area as well. Uh, we see the same thing happening in, in uh, Sydney and this is just recently uh, released imagery from uh, Victoria Cross Station. There's a whole range of this work occurring all the way around Melbourne Metro, uh, the various different projects emerging in Sydney, and also around the projects in, in Brisbane that are looking at a far more aspirational outcome and we're, we're tackling the, uh, the different outcomes to do with uh, delivering major integrated development over, over rail. So I think for me, the, um, the, the level of aspiration we're seeing in Australia is lifting on the back of these major Metro projects. And I think that uh, hopefully we're going to see these, these projects delivered and see some really exciting new urban precincts in our major, major urban centres. So just to wrap up, um, I think the key thing here is uh, transit-led city transformation. And I, I come from a planning background, so obviously I like to think of these things at a strategic, strategic level. Uh, every time we think about spending a dollar on public transport, we need to balance these three key items. If we're not delivering livability at a city scale, but also at a very local scale, if we're not delivering on economic performance, job creation, vitality, entrepreneurship, and also those accessibility <coughs> outcomes that are so fundamental to a transport project, we're not delivering the kind of infrastructure that's fit for purpose. And uh, the key ingredients for that, I believe, uh, making sure that we have a city building mindset and uh, 
the levels of investment in these projects in uh, the government arena uh, actually galvanise governments to align the activities of their various departments, which is fundamental to that. That leads to a series of clear priorities and could also open the door for better-led placemaking and uh, a clear narrative as well. So I think, in summary, uh, the, uh, the future is looking bright, but we need to make sure that we target the outcomes effectively to deliver the right sort of livability and economic outcomes for our cities in the future. Thank you. Thank you.